Hello everyone, this is Professor Hall. Today we are talking about County Cullen, one of the poets of the Harlem Renaissance. And I'm going to redo this poem that I have here on the title screen because I think it embodies a lot of what Cullen was trying to do in his work. Then we'll talk about his life and then we will get into two more of his poems that you'll be looking at more for our class. And you'll have to forgive me because I do have a so I hope I do his work justice. Here we go. Heritage. What is Africa to me? Copper sun or scarlet sea? Jungle star or jungle track? Strong bronzed men or regal black women from whose loins I sprang when the birds of Eden sang? One three centuries removed from the scenes his fathers loved. Spicy grove cinnamon tree. What is Africa to me? So what I love about this poem is that it's a very traditional poem in terms of its structure. It has a definite rhyme scheme, me, C, track, black, right, A, A, B, B, C, C, etc. Um, but he's trying to take these classic forms and then imbue them with his own culture, his own heritage, um, you know, as a voice in the Harlem Renaissance. That's something that was important to him. He says, and we'll look at it later, that he wanted to be a great poet, not just a great black poet. Um, but I think that he really um, does try to imbue the traditional forms of poetry with um, new images that hadn't really been seen in poetry up to that point. So I think in that sense, he's very, um, he pushes things forward quite a bit for literature, although we have other poets at the time who are writing in much different, you know, experimental kind of styles. Um, to me, what he's trying to do is really important that he's, um, he sees himself as one of the many voices of uh, literature and like many of the other poets that came before him, kind of taking inspiration from them and then kind of doing his own thing with it, if that makes sense. But the other thing that I love here is just the gorgeous imagery and also just asking what what does Africa mean? What does it mean to me as somebody who is 300 years removed from it that um, it means you know, beautiful suns and beautiful seas and strong men and regal women and the birds of Eden. So uh, having a religious or biblical allusion in there to the Garden of Eden, that this is a place almost untouched, right? And living as he did in a very bustling city of Harlem in the 1920s, you can see how he views the differences here between um, the homeland of his his fathers, his ancestors, and thinking about what it means to him and uh, and how he can kind of convey that meaning to other people to show the beauty in that land where we still have a lot of racism going on even now. <laughs> but particularly at that point where um, a lot of our poets and writers and authors at this time are kind of trying to redefine um, beauty standards and redefine uh, culture and redefine heritage and redefine history and taking it in for themselves. And he does kind of all of that in this very short poem. So uh, I love it. It's one of my favorites. So let's talk about Cullen and his life. Life. He was born in 1903, raised by his grandmother. He moved to Harlem when he was nine. So a lot of our other authors uh, migrated up north later on in life or uh, moved into Harlem when they were uh, adults. But he was really there as a young child. His grandmother passed when he was 15, and then he was adopted by the Reverend Friedrich Cullen, the pastor of Salem Methodist Episcopal Church, which was uh, a very prominent black church in Harlem at the time. The Reverend was so prominent uh, that he later served as the president of the Harlem NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. So... Cullen would have really been influenced from a young age by all of this. And I think you can see um, the, the idea of the advancement of colored people in a lot of his work, the idea that um, there could be more 
uh, opportunity and and all of that. You know, we talked about with Elaine Locke's work that we have um, this idea of something new that before uh, a lot of African Americans were fighting just for education and and things like that, and now many of them have education and they want to contribute to the um, culture and heritage of the United States in a different way, right? And so that kind of thing would have been influencing him from a very young age, as would the religious uh, influences, which I think we see throughout his poetry. Um, yeah, so he was at the center of culture and politics uh, for a very long time. The height of his popularity, he entered NYU after high school, uh, and then was later accepted into Harvard's master's program. So uh, highly educated, going to some of the best schools in the country. His first poems were published in The Crisis, which was uh, edited and, and kind of heralded by W.E.B. Du Bois and Opportunity, a magazine published by the National Urban League. The literary critic and Harvard professor Irving Babbitt lauded his, his work, particularly The Ballad of the Brown Girl, in 1925, uh, it was a bumper year for his harvest of literary prizes. That just means he, he won a lot of stuff, right? He published his first complete volume of poetry called Color. And so what you have here is somebody who is like a rising star, right? Um, he is a, a bright young man who has is got roots in Harlem uh, with the NAACP, with um, a very prominent church that would have been kind of at the center of life for a lot of people. And he's noticed by W.E.B. Du Bois. So he marries Yolanda Du Bois, and I can't express this enough, that social event of the season. We have records, and I'm going to show you just in a minute, of uh how big their wedding was, how many people were there, what they were serving. I mean, this was a huge wedding. And it kind of seems to be that this is just part of the guest list. Uh, she had, I think, 16 bridesmaids. Um, and there is uh, all of his people are there as well. I'm going to kind of zoom in on that for you. There we go. So this is just the groom side. Um, just the groom side. And then, uh, up here is just the bride side. So you can imagine how many people were up the altar with them. Some of them look like, eh, this might not be the best idea. Um, and there is Yolanda in the middle. So it seems though to be that this was kind of set up by W.E.B. Du Bois, that he wanted his daughter, who was also highly educated, to be connected to, um, someone who could become a prominent figure in Harlem at that time in the Harlem social scene. Um, I don't know how long they courted, but the marriage did not last for very long. What happened is that he, um, they went on honeymoon and he also brought his best man. And then Yolanda wrote some things to her father stating that this, basically this marriage was a sham that she felt trapped and that he was, in fact, a, a closeted homosexual. So around this time, uh, he won the Guggenheim Fellowship to write poetry in France. And he believed that art transcended race. He wanted to be a poet and not a Negro poet, as I kind of stated before. But the, the, the marriage, though very, um, though a, a very huge wedding, uh, did not last even a year. And there were rumors about his sexuality. He did marry a second time to a woman, but these rumors kind of plagued his career. Um, we're going to talk more about sexuality with one of our other writers later in the term. But basically, a number of prominent figures in the Harlem Renaissance have uh, rumors or uh, some some of them have a little more um basis for some of these rumors that they were gay or bisexual or uh, in some way queer, as we would kind of say now. And I, you know, we don't know, <laughs> basically. I think based on Yolanda's writing, we have some pretty strong evidence for uh, for that in, in Cullen. But um, 
regardless, his career started to kind of wane a little bit, especially after the wedding. And I, I'm not sure, it seems to me like maybe um, he didn't have the patronage anymore of W.E.B. Du Bois and, uh, and maybe was plagued by some of these rumors and that kind of affected him. It also, um, sometimes people saw him as a more old fashioned poet. As we saw in the beginning, he follows a really set structure. Many of his poems have a rhyme scheme and kind of a traditional uh, lyric style. And so there's a romantic tradition of John Keats, Percy Shelley, and, and those kind of things that many of the authors, you know, the Harlem Renaissance is part of the lost generation. So it's kind of like a movement within a movement, if that if that makes sense. Um, and... The Lost Generation, as you hopefully have learned by now, they're more interested in experimentation in form and um, and pushing the boundaries in terms of content and rejecting the old ways. So, so to me, it's not given the way that he wrote that he wasn't as popular, but... It's also not surprising that he was kind of um, possibly discriminated against because of his sexuality, because that would have been very common at the time. Uh, one of our other authors was arrested for homosexual activity, and they could arrest people for it. They could um, put people into sanitariums, all of that kind of thing. So I I don't know. <laughs> I don't know really the reason, but... Basically, many people saw him as someone who had a lot of potential, um, who had some great work at the beginning of his career and who never seemed to like fully develop or fully live up to that potential. But I think still that his poems are amazing and uh, worthy of note and worthy of uh, analysis and looking at and examining and all of that kind of thing. So... So I'm going to stop here so that you don't have like a 30 minute video to watch. And when we come back in our next video, we're going to look specifically at two of his poems to a brown boy and to a brown girl. We'll talk about some of the themes and we'll look at how they compare to some of those traditional poems of the past and how he kind of responds to the literature that he loved as a child. So that's coming up. Stay tuned.